Hey everybody, it's Kyle at Silver Sound Guitar. And in today's video, we have Sean Melody from Product 42 Records. It's a local record label here in town. He stopped by Silver Sound Studio to chat about what it's like to run a, a local record label. And so throughout the video, you're going to hear questions from the studio audience. And Sean will also just give you some extra information. So be sure to stick around through the whole video to make sure your question gets answered. And if it's not even asked, of course, you can always leave a comment below and we will definitely get that question answered for you. So sit back and enjoy the video and thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any videos in the future. Enjoy. Thank you, Merck, and everyone here for having us out. You know, this is, you know, uh, first time for everything. Um, I don't know, for those of you who don't know who we are, we're a local record label doing alternative and underground music. Um, we started in 2021 after I started releasing music. Um, there's, let's see, we have, right now we're working with about 27 different artists worldwide, ranging from bands in Colorado to bands in um, Germany, France, England, um, Norway, um, <laughs> just, to, just to name a few. Um, pretty much, uh, let's see, what was I thinking? Like, uh, we have a crazy kind of story of where we started because this wasn't what we thought we were going to be doing. We just started putting out music in 2020 after after 10 years of me relearning how to play music after a traumatic head injury. Um, so kind of 2020 happened. I was like, hey, need to put out music just in case something happens to me. You know, that way family, friends can find it. Within a couple of weeks, we had a record, a couple of record label offers that were pretty big and whatnot. Um, with my health, I'm not able to, uh, to tour or travel really. So we negotiated a digital distribution deal. So pretty much I was able to put our, mu our music anywhere in the world that we want to put it at this point <laughs> with it, without having to think second, second guessing on it, without having to pay somewhere like DistroKid or CD Baby or whatnot, and maybe have it taken down if we look at them wrong, <laughs> you know. Um, from there, like, after about a year putting music out, the owner of the distribution was like, hey, guess what? You have the max Facebook friends. Out of those friends, out of those 5,000 friends, 4,000 of them are musicians. 3,000 of them are unsigned. You do the math. And I, so I'm like, well, we don't have the, the funds and stuff. And he's like, you negotiated the funds. So we started Product 42. Our first release that wasn't something of my own was Sever the Servants, which is a conglomerate from um, members of Carrion, which is a Norwegian death metal industrial band, and members of um, Hitchcock Guillotine, which is from Lansing, Michigan. Um, and they gave me a really amazing demo and they're like, would you want to put this out? What, what do you think of it? Can you give us a write-up? And I looked at April and said, do you want to start a record label? <laughs> and pretty much from there, it's, uh, we've done 67 releases as of tomorrow. Um, and the two years that we've been running, we have... Seven, seven artists that are just joining our, our label between now and January 30th uh, for another seven, seven more releases, uh, et cetera. Um, so we're kind of, we're picking up steam, I guess, is the best way to put it. With the, I guess I'll talk about our journey because I said, you know, I had a traumatic brain injury that got me to where we were at. In 2020, uh, 28, uh, 2008, I was a chef. Uh, that's part of how I know Mark. Um, and I took a head injury that uh, about approximately 100 pounds of frozen meat metal to the head. And I lost all my musical knowledge, yeah, all music theory, all. I would look at a piano. I couldn't tell you what the notes were anymore. 
I could, I still can't, I, if I work on a bass or a violin or a guitar, I still have to write down every single note, every single string, whatnot, just to be, to keep that in the memory. Um, if I'm not, I can play by ear, but, you know, <laughs> everyone can play something by ear. You know, that's, uh, um, with that, I didn't think I was ever going to play an instrument again. Um, I played 27 instruments before my accident, and I'm back to 14 at this moment. And that's part of where we kind of got to where we're at because I would have been working with musicians in Colorado for approximately 40 years. So I started on piano in, when I was six years old at up in Denver with um, Sarah Keene, uh, who was the pianist for, or piano teacher for um, the Denver Symphony Orchestra. Um, and kind of went from there, went into trumpet, went into cello and whatnot. And then teenage years happened. What, what, I met guitar. <laughs> met guitar and kind of didn't look back from about 1986, 87 on. I was doing playing in signed thrash bands and speed metal bands, kind of at the rise of that whole evolution of things. And discovered punk rock and industrial right around the same time and, and kind of warped my fragile little mind. <laughs> um, and I didn't realize, you know, you could take a screen, a wall of computer screens and mic it up and use that as percussion or, you know, pieces of sheet metal. So that was made anything I had learned about heavy metal and everything seemed tame. And, you know, so back in the 80s, you know, going to a concert in a junkyard and you see flames and stuff like that going because that are supposed to be there, you, you, it changes uh, your perception of things of what you want to do with your future. <laughs> um, uh, pretty much from that point, I started DJing, and I've been DJing in Colorado since 1992 starting at Rock Island up in Denver, which we did, I don't know, we did amazing shows with people ranging from PIL to um, attrition to some of the up-and-coming synth pop artists of the last two, uh, two three decades. Um, let me see. Through that, you know, we were, we've been DJing down here, booking shows and stuff for the past, what, probably 10 years at least uh, we were we helped with starting um a couple of the clubs around here we helped with most of the goth industrial events we were kind of the person the people the go-to people for that if you wanted a goth industrial band playing in colorado and colorado springs you came to us or um, we either helped you did it or we got you to somebody who could get you there um, we from there we with my health we had to walk away for a while i turned it over to Aaron Hernandez of Witch Hands. And that's where some of the new scene of stuff that's been coming out of the Colorado Springs Underground is coming out of now. Um, while all of that was coming up and we were dealing with my health is while we were birthing Product 42. Like at this moment, it's been a labor of love, but at this point we've got, you know, we're starting to get some notice around, around the wax tracks level. Um, because we're, that's kind of what we were shooting for is a wax tracks idea, something that's going to change the music industry, not just for us, but for artists in general, because that's a, we started out as artists. So we don't want to take from the artists. We want to give artists the opportunity to move forward. Uh, if you, you want to put out music, as long as you're putting out decent music and you're willing to take some direction, we're most likely going to be willing to put you out. If you're coming to us with something that's uh, hateful and saying, hey, let's divide people even more, we're probably going to tell you to take a walk. <laughs> but that's, uh, you know, that should be probably, I think, uh, you know, part of the responsibility of art is knowing what you're actually pushing and stuff. Um, for those who were here early, you might have heard some of our some of our artists playing because we had our 2023 sampler playing. Um, some of our artists, like I Am Warface, was featured on a BBC a radio show last night called Transmission, which is known for helping out artists like Gary Newman and um, New Order and work hosting Gelder Craft and other new up-and-coming artists. Um, we had 
microwave to who is another band that's worked with with people like Gravity Kills and stuff that, that were featured, have been featured on probably five or six articles within the interviews, articles within the last month. Um, because the oh, when earlier this year they came out with an album called The Dead Shall Walk, which is filled with collaborations. There's not a song on that album that doesn't have at least two other artists on it. So we get done with this album, and he decides he wants to do a remix album. Usually you get a remix album, you know, you might get four or five remixes. We got 33 total, and only one of them didn't make it, make the cut. They were that good from across the industry, going from, from people you've never heard of who maybe did some of the best remixes I've ever heard in my life to people that, that, you, that you've heard of uh, if you're in the electronic music scene, ranging from people like Stephen Olaf, from, um, I'm trying to think who else, because there's so, just so many that, that did that. Um, at this point, we have a, an, an almost constant influx of music. So, <laughs> I mean, that's one of the coolest things about running a record label is I never have to look for music. It's more like, what don't we want, I want to listen to today? Kind of, yeah. Can we ask questions? Yeah, you can feel free. That I'm starting to run out. Of, I run out of ideas, so I'll answer any questions you want. <laughs> want to know? Um, yeah. You know, when I grew up, uh, you know, we bought cassette tapes, tracks, albums, CDs. Yeah. Like, the world has changed now. So, how does a musician? I mean, kids don't go into stores anymore to buy albums. Uh, what? How do you make money? Well, uh, so it, 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 they, kids still actually do. It's just cha the the industry has been changing a lot. The we went through this this weird dark ages phase when digital really started popping up, and everyone thought that we were going to lose a vinyl, we were going to lose CD, we lost cassette for a few years, you know. Um, but over the last five to six years, physical media has gone crazy. If people want cassettes. People want vinyl. People want CDs. So that's w just one of the many markets. With the, with the rise of digital, you also have uh, markets like NS uh, N M NFTs. I almost called NSSTs, which is one of our bands <laughs> that's coming out. Um, but you have NFTs uh, as one, uh, one market. You also have all the streaming platforms that five years ago, most of us had no uh, uh, no connection or app or way to actually earn royalties off of our music. It didn't matter who we were, unless you were signed to a, one of the big seven, uh, Virgin Records, Capital, et cetera. You didn't really know how to do go about that. Now, all you have to do is go do a Google search and you can get your music on, online. You can get your BMI and ASCAP for royalty fees. You can get your uh, physical licensing, Your uh, all of those which is uh, fully different than how we looked at it as local musicians, as independent musicians for decades. Like most of it, as you know, we've had to ha get somebody else to do that for us. Um, outside of that, we also have direct merchandising and print on demand, which is something that that has broken down so many doors for, for artists, musicians, and, and labels. Because I can, we can put up together a site that has CDs, records, T-shirts, stickers, all in one place. We don't have to carry inventory. You can say, hey, I want that CD, I want that record, I want that shirt. And instead of somebody holding it, uh, holding it as soon as you put that order in, they start, press, uh, they start printing them. So it cuts back on the cost that we have to put back to the consumer as well because... Being in, in the day and age we're in, finances are tight for a lot of people, even if you're making $17, 18 $25 an hour. So if you're going to pay $20 an album, that album better be spectacular. And you better be able to get it the easiest way you want that album. So that means if you want to go into a store, it should be in a store. If you, wanna, if you don't want to get up off your computer and you're like, I want that double album with it signed and everything, you should be able to go, okay, product42.com. Oh, here's their band camp. This is where I can find their physical store. Boom. And order it. And then order that and realize that it's being printed right for you. 
<laughs> so that's something that that we have never had access to, which is just amazing. Some of the amazing new jumps in technology that we have. Anything else? <laughs> how does um, how do, how, your musicians that you have or the people that you uh, represent? Yeah. I do a lot of online marketing with social media. Um, as I said, I started a lot of this through uh, Facebook. Um, I've had a pretty huge Facebook presence for a couple decades because of doing local promotion and marketing. So I I work I network with peop, DJs all over the world. Uh, every release we have gets dropped to at least 100 DJs worldwide. So whether they're going to play goth, whether they're going to play metal, whether they're going to play hip hop, it doesn't really matter. We're, if you're on our, our DJ list, you're going to get a copy of the album and you can decide whether you want to play it. So that's just one of our folds. The other thing is we use every medium that we can, whether it's making reels, whether it's making videos on YouTube, whether it's going out and doing shows and promoting it, opening up for other bands last Actually, we're right on the year mark of of me opening up for a band, Alice, that we brought out here that ended up doing the title track for our Club Q benefit uh, after that just because of doing that. So you get a lot of word of the mouth. It's, you still have a lot of what we grew up with if you were in the 70s, 80s, 90s of the word of mouth. But now it's just bigger. You have a a wider market that you can talk to. Like you can literally pick up your phone and talk to somebody in China, in Israel, in Australia, in Africa. And for all you know, those people could be your next fans. Like, that's kind of how we've gotten some of our newest artists. <laughs> it's like, they're like, we heard this band on Tencent. How do you feel about doing a, a, a release with a South American artist? And we ended up with a South American artist after that. <laughs> so, you know. And so we have all kinds of different ways at this moment. There's, if you can't find a way to reach an audience, you're not trying hard enough. Is pretty much where I'm at nowadays. Anything else? How do you guys deal with distribution? So as I said, we worked out we worked out a distribute a digital distribution deal with one of the big European companies that you know, like. Uh, um, kind of like The Orchard and, and similar that do your all-in-one aggregation. Um, instead of like CD Baby or, um, or DistroKid where you pay X amount and you can only put up so many releases and whatnot. You, we do, if you bring it to me and say, hey, we want this up on Friday. As long as it passes, my, it passes uh, April, my QC, we're going to put it up on our distribution, and then it'll be five to seven days before it's up. And that's really about it, but that'll be worldwide. That'll be on satellite streaming. That'll be on regular streaming services, you know, all the big ones like Amazon, Spotify, um, Pandora. But I'm trying to think. There's uh, Because there's 70-plus main distri um, channels that we distribute to in 200-plus countries. So, and that's growing every day. Like we just merged with a couple of another distribution company. So we just got some, some distribution and some of the countries that people aren't happy with right now, but, but at the same time, it doesn't matter. It's music going to people who are going to enjoy music. So <laughs> that's one of the, that's one of the ways. The other way when we're dealing with digital, with physical distribution, as I, as I said, we have a, a physical print on demand. Right now we're working on also doing some distribution direct to record labels, uh, record stores and consumers and other things like that. Um, just so more people can get their hands on it at more places. So, but we, we do deal with full aggregation on that too. So like if say you put release music through us and Somebody's like, hey, I really want, I, I really like this. I'm going to put it in a reel. You're going to get a royalty for that because we, uh, we've set up, we've set up um, content ID, which is something a lot of places don't do and we don't talk about. Content ID is, is part of the, the next big thing in, in streaming. It's, uh, we, we've heard a lot about people getting sued for, using, for lip syncing or using somebody's music on a Facebook uh, thing, uh, video or post. This keeps that from happening. Because 
as we put out music, it's already registered in that. So if you use one of our songs on a reel, we're going to get that royalty cut. If I use one of your songs on, say, a video, you're going to get the, the royalty cut, and you're also going to be able to say, you know what, I don't like your product that doesn't represent what I represent. You, so, no, you can't use that, and it'll just literally cut the cut the cut to the chase on some of that, which is something that artists haven't really had that access for years, <laughs> you know. So. How much is the royalty cuts change from every different service. Like Spotify, depending on the level of plays you have, depending on the level of coverage you have, depends on your, your royalty cut. Most of them all have, like, how with social media, you have algorithms that, that up your, your, viewable, uh, your viewable audience and stuff. Like, we just hit 11 days where we're getting exposed to 100,000 people because of our, our um, connection. And we're doing some of that with, <laughs> it's going kind of the same way, I guess, is the best way to put it. Um, if it was, it was like Spotify, you're going to get a percentage of a percentage of a percentage of a cent just for a regular play. You hit that next one, and that might be instead of 0. 0.000075, it might be 0. 0.0013. And then you hit the next one, and that becomes 0. 0.01. And then it becomes... Yeah, you need you need volume. You need you need to work on building yourself just as much as you would uh, any uh, any other way as an artist. I learned something from Grant the other day. He was telling me that on YouTube, I have a song that I put on mm -hmm. that I wrote. He says YouTube owns your song. That if I was to let's say if you were talking about um, let's say young when you, when you agree to terms of service for posting. Like when I was at a taxi.com uh, convention, their entertainment lawyers were saying that when you post content on YouTube, YouTube, when you click the, uh, the terms, you automatically are signing a year, an um, auto renewal year contract. They're, they're, they're with most services, you have something like that. They don't own the content. They own the rights to use the content. So if any, you put that song up on YouTube, you, YouTube can choose to put that in any one of their commercials and you don't have a choice on it. And that's kind of more where that's at. But if they do that, they also have to let you know and they also have to pay you. That, so there's a, you, it's always good with any digital service, w whether it's whether it's a plugin for an instrument, whether it's a VST, whether it's a streaming service, to look at that fine print because you never know. Like Facebook almost got away with taking every, the rights of everyone's art, uh, what was it, 10 years ago. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's always good to look in those things. That's part of why we also do this is being a record label, we already put, it already gives us some leeway that an, an independent artist doesn't already have. It puts people already higher up on that algorithm for earnings, for visibility, et cetera, just being signed. And then you add that your your own algorithm of your own fan base in there. That puts it up to another place. Um, so so when most of the time, most artists aren't going to have to deal with worry about that. Uh, um, but when they do, there are things to actually cover your butt on that. <laughs> So that's uh, one of the reasons it's good to have uh, your music up as many places as you can put it, uh, you know, and that it's obviously yours. So because you want to have those rights, you want to make sure you have your publishing taken care of. You want to make sure you have your BMI or your ASCAP, or your pro uh, taken care of. So it doesn't matter what YouTube says or what Amazon says or what Facebook says. Um, that's part of why things like Content um, Manager are so so good in content ideas because you can turn around and be like, oh, you've been using this on this. So that means if I can't get uh, get uh, get something back from you, I'm going to go to my manager or my my label head or rep whatnot and have them get on your case because like probably three times a week I'm dealing with Spotify just being like, hey, you gave our artists songs to another artist. I'm not a hip hop artist, I, you know, so you've got that in everything. Uh, it's a daily thing of constantly a, a new learning experience, but always read that little, that fine print. <laughs> so, uh, 
So you mentioned in people one on Zip about the and if they go to your website, uh -huh. you direct them to like a per se like a fan. How do you deal with dot coms for the fan? It, it depends. We we have a we have a site that's that's under construction right now, and that will give most of our artists uh, uh, x uh, x at product42.com. If you want your own, that's you know that's something uh, that that we can discuss depending on earnings, depending on what you want to put in, depending on. Um, but we do try, like if you sign up, if you work with us. We cover the Bandcamp Pro uh, fees. We care or cover most of the Pro fees and Pro registration uh, across the platforms. That way, you guys don't have to, and you can just be an artist and focus on your art. We because the, our belief really is, you know your art better than us. You're going to produce the better the the better art than us. We're just going to have that 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 fine tuning and that tweaking that can get it out somewhere else. So. Um, yeah, my my wife April and I, who's my business partner, set it up as a partnership LLC, and part, uh, that way, one we uh, we have it as a fifty fifty split. That way, we have both a female, a full female representation, and also a full dis disabled representation for it. Because in this day and age, I think it's uh, we both believe it's very important to send a strong message of, of being accepting of diversity when there's so much going against uh, uh, any of us of being getting along <laughs> you know uh, so uh, yeah that's we set it up as that and at this point I until we get much bigger we're not thinking about going to incorporating or anything like that you know the more we can keep costs down for for our artists and our fans and stuff like that the better how do you guys handle support? How do you We're learning that right now, actually. <laughs> um, we've got we have some we have some uh, some artists that are coming that we're working on setting up for our first tours in 2024. We're hopefully getting I am Warface over. Uh, we're looking at getting brides over from Norway, um, where they might possibly also do some carrion sets and several of the servant sets. Uh, and, and then we're, but we're right now what we're doing is we're working on finding um, a tour manager, finding tour managers who will work specifically for us and our, and our artists. So at the end of the day, we can be like, hey, this is our bus. This is our, our this is our, our, our manager. They're going to make sure you get to every place that you need to go because enough of us spent time in station wagons or compact cars with the whole backseat filled with synths and amps and guitars. Why? Most of us, uh, some of us had, uh, were in more debt when we came back than when we started, you know, and that's not how touring should be. And this day and age, we have all the, the access to everything we need to get at anywhere in the world for relatively cheap. We have access to get our music everywhere, our art everywhere. So there's no reason that we should have to make it such a tooth pulling grind to get from point A to point B with touring. So um, at this moment, we're also working on a, um, a media site. We're called Product 42 Media, Music and Media because we also have graphic services and video services. Uh, out of our 67 releases, 45 of the album covers we've either taken the art done the photography for done the layout for done the graphic creation or all of it um, we do a lot of the uh, all of our most of our mixing is done in-house uh, either by us or one of our other artists because kind of we're going with that uh, you know that belief that the more you network the more you work with other people the more the, it's just going to help build you farther um, so that's really kind of where we look at everything. If we can remix another artist, uh, you know, another artist, we're going to probably trade them. Hey, you do this remix, I'll do a remix for you. You, you do this. Well, <laughs> and that's, that's a lot of the music industry. If you, if you don't under, whoever hasn't understood that is missing out on the biggest, the biggest secret of the music industry is networking. Like, all, and we're in a cool industry, so you know, 
You can't be like, oh, I've got to deal with those musicians again. Oh. But when you're like, wait, I am those musicians. Oh, oh wait. <laughs> so, you know, you're dealing with the coolest people and the coolest atmospheres 90% of the time. So, you know, you've got to start looking at how, how to network that even bigger. How to, you know, you might, you might be like, hey, this person's not working well in our, in my group, but I know of a better group for them. And that might end up leading to you to finding the guitarist or singer that, that just pushes your band over the top or, you know, the person that, that you click with musically for the rest of your life. It can also lead to, uh, you know, things like getting a record label <laughs> or getting signed or, you know. Or, yeah, like, so one of our bands, um, I Am Warface, I, I keep talking about them because they're just, they are so right there and ready to go. They just got, um, a few months ago, got the drummer from Placebo out of one of those issues. Now, their old drummer couldn't show up for a gig. And they were all like, well, we don't really want to cancel on this. We've, it's been booked. It's be a big, a big thing. And we had Rolling Stone UK there and other things. And they talk to a guy, and he's like, well, hey, I'll find you a drummer. Next, uh, next day, it was Steve Hewitt from Placebo. And he's now the new drummer for I Am Warface and helping re-record and rewrite the, the album. That's, and that's what we're waiting on for their second album. <laughs> so, you know, you've got really cool stuff going on on all levels. Like, yeah, so ne networking should not be... It shouldn't be a bad word. It should be it should be people's bible when it comes to artistic endeavors in general. <laughs> so I'll ask the question, Sean. So as somebody who owns a music label, how do you make money? Uh, other means. No, <laughs> we're, 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 we're start, we break even right on and off right now because we're in our, our, our first uh, fledgling years, you know, it's a little tight, but we make money off of our, from our royalty rates, from our streaming rates, from membership and VIP rates, because uh, through Bandcamp, you know, and other services, you can do membership rates like Patreon or whatnot. Um, so we make we make nibbles all over that side of things. We're working on the sync side of things where, you know, working with TV, film, and, and video game industry, which is more where you're going to make more money than you are off of sales. Realistically, you know, you can make, if you get, say, a video game, a uh, song and say, a uh, Blizzard video game, that can literally make more than a, a million sales right there off of it for you. And then you're going to have that that snowball effect afterwards, and that's that's kind of where we're working on things at this moment. Is any way we can diversify to bring in music? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, so, so for those not familiar, sync licensing has to do with uh, with licensing out your music, your art, whatnot to film music to any other professional industry that, that could use it in um, a way to market their music or their art or their movie, whatever they're working on. With that, is that when you do that, uh, do a sync license, say, say we, you sold 30 seconds of a song to Netflix. Every time that 30 seconds plays on Netflix, you get a royalty for that. But you also get paid up front for that. So you're going to continue getting a residual income off of things like sync licensing, um, not getting your, your songs in movies, getting your songs in, in commercials, getting them in um, video games especially. Video games are ridiculous because a video game can sell 24 million copies the day it comes out and then play your song 24 million times a day over and over and over again. When you think about that, you it starts making sense on why some artists try to get their stuff in movies, why people, like, you'll hear people say, oh, Dead Kennedy's sold out because they, this song was in this Nike commercial. Well, Jello Biafra is, isn't is eating Jello at this point, <laughs> if you want, if you catch my drift on that, um, you know. Things like Black uh, Black Sabbath being in commercials, you know, we all have seen how 
Ozzy and Tony Iommi live and stuff, <laughs> you know. So sync licenses is one of the one of those big ways to make money this day, in this day and age. And you can sync license. You know, Mark was asking. You can sync license anything. If there's if an art if a if a if an industry wants to use your music to come out on stage and like have somebody come out on stage just to do a talk to kids, it can be sync licensed. And it, like for schools, music has been sync licensed uh, from friends of mine. Um, for the Air Force Academy, it will sync license the music from you. Um, different uh, um, museums and different uh, places like that will, as well as the film industry. Like it's if you're just looking at one side of it, you're really limiting yourself because in this day and age of, of technology and music. You have a full spectrum of what you can reach. Uh, like there, if you say something's off the table, that's you putting it off the table, because there's no reason you cannot find the, the knowledge out there in this day and age, or somebody who can do it for you, or might want to work with you that way. I mean, collaboration. I keep going back to networking and collaboration, but that goes back to that. Like, if you can't do it, somebody else can, and probably wants to work with you. <laughs> I we do. Um, we are running a little bit slower with that because there are some changes in the industry going on right now. I don't know how many of you have followed the 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 strike, but also the strike is a big one right now. Um, well, it's over, but they just signed the agreement this past week, so nobody really has been back to work on that side of things. Uh, some people have been, if they've been crossing picket lines, but uh, X, Y, and Z, a lot of the, a, a lot of the industry hasn't been coming to us saying, hey, we need this score. We need this song, or can we buy this? Because look, Dune's, uh, Dune was supposed to come out last month and it's not coming out until, uh, what is it, February now? Other movies aren't even coming out until June, July, September of next year. So, that kind of messed with things. But also, if you've been following what's been going on with the song trader and band camp and stuff like that, uh, when uh, with that going through and the changes going on, that kind of changes the dynamic for people like Blue Buddha, who is a, our sync license agencies that deal directly with your music supervisors at Netflix, at Hulu, whatnot. Because now through SoundCloud and Bandcamp, you'll be able to pitch your songs directly. Since we're in a record label side of things, instead of having to go, hey, we need to talk with Brian over at Blue Buddha, we think this song would be good for something, we can go straight to, to Blizzard and be like, hey, you know how Diablo's got this, uh, this, this great big scary red beast as your, your final thing? Well, we've got a song called Red Queen by this band that would be perfect for a commercial. You should check it out, you know? And uh, so... Right now, it's a really changing industry, like, and the, uh, like whether you have connections or not to the film industry, doesn't even matter at this point. In some ways, it's kind of that whole algorithm thing of what I was talking about. Yes. How has AI changed your part? Honestly, AI has not touched my side of the industry much. I see a lot of people who might have held off on, uh, on albums for one to five years because of uh, e either not being able to afford album art or not knowing what to do. There's a lot of AI album cover creation. There was one of the album covers that I've worked on. Actually, the main art started out as AI art, and then I manipulated the hell out of it. And <laughs> But, you know, I, we haven't really been seeing a lot of it in the music side. We'll see some... Or we haven't directly. I've seen some assistant um, AI for arpeggiators and stuff to make them, instead of just being the same four notes, start going, okay, well, this is how the rest of your song is going, so we're going to take that key change and we'll work that into your arpeggiator, arpeggio without you doing more than holding down the th four keys, which I didn't understand arpeggiators until like the last four years, so. <laughs> which is kind of funny, so... Um, anything else? Anyone? Anyone? 
Ferris Bueller? <laughs> Recording. Well, that's that 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 is something we are just starting to really relook into, because we have we have a recording studio in in the place that we that we run everything out of. We run our our media site, which includes Le, uh, Lego City and Lego Channel, <laughs> and then we ha- on the other side of that same studio has or that same basement has a full recording studio with synths, guitars. Via MIX, you know, all the plugins. So we do that if you, that way. If, say, you already have somebody you work with that you like, like, say, Silver Sound Guitar or something like that, you want to record here and release it through us, we're not going to say no. If we can help you out, we will help you out. But most of the time, we don't like to put our, put our fingers in too much because we don't want to take too much of the pie. So, like, if you if you have a way that you want to record, we're going to help you out. If we can do it for you, we're going to help you out. If, if you want to do it on your phone and can get me good tracks, we'll help you out. Like, Promised Land Band. If you've actually listened to that that album, it's it's straightforward hip hop from Canada, but most of that album was recorded on a phone in a car, uh, and it sounds as crispy as any Dr. Dre album. So <laughs> that's that's kind of where we ha- how we handle recording because as I've been saying over and over again the industry is changing and has changed so much so that things that that we wanted the, that I wanted to do 20 years ago are possible without me leaving my room like and I don't need more than a computer or a phone or and a guitar uh, I mean, I have a lot more, but I don't need, you know. And if you've if you've ever messed with a DAW and you understand anything about MIDI and MIDI sequencing and quantizing, you realize that you can that you can make a str- a, 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 a VST, a virtual synth, a, a sound like a, a bowed instrument if you want to, just with the changing thing, little bits like the attack, the delay, the decay, uh, whatnot. So. Some of, some of the, my best work has been in after a seizure on the floor with an iPad going, ah, let's see, I like this sound right here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> you know, and I'm going, okay, that sounds too synthetic. Let's tweak this. Let's change that. And so if, if you've got a vision, we're there to help you out is more mostly. Now that, you know, we've reconnected with Mark, I'm sure we're going to be sending more people at, at you guys, too. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Do you live here in the spring? Yes, yes, we do. We live on the southeast side. We're kind of over by Memorial Park. So, you know, a good, a good, a good place for a bunker and, and a recording studio that stay inconspicuous. <laughs> And we have, uh, there's also tons of musicians and artists over there. We're like right down the road from places like Frisky's, uh, which used to be Fritzy's. Um, what used to be the Zodiac, I think, is now what, Green Line now? Um, and I can't even remember everything that's changed in the last two years because, like, what, Vultures popped up and another venue's place, and then you've got. And just venues everywhere popping up on that side of town. It's becoming like the hipster, posh side of town, which when we moved over there, we were like, wait, um, are we supposed to be here? <laughs> so, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's fun. We love, we, we love where we live and what we're doing. <laughs> when we moved down here 15 years ago, this place was... It reminded me of Denver, Lakewood area in the 70s, 80s, early 90s. Now now you can walk around and, like, I've run into celebrities down here that you would only think about running into in places like L.A. Like, we ran into, I was walking out of a grocery store and we ran into Jenna Ortega from Wednesday at one point. Just going, wait, what? And then they, they were like, wait, what? Don't you do music? Wait, what? Oh. <laughs> it's, it, that's a weird one of the weirdest things I've got to say about running a record label is this was not something we planned out so it's still we're still wrapping our heads around it so we'll be out and somebody will be like are you and we're like 
wait, what? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That is me. That, I forgot. I didn't even think about that because most of the time we're we're pushing our own our bands, not our, our own projects. I had one of our artists get mad at me earlier today before we came in. They're all like, why don't you ever put up Oso or Raid stuff? I'm like, because I'm putting your guys' stuff out. They're all like, but, but you're doing music too. You should be, but I'm putting your guys' stuff out. <laughs> so, you know, we do, we get some goofy craziness. It's the best industry in the world, I can say at this point. When, when you get into being able to do music professionally, you start getting paid, you realize that there's a, there's something different that, that can change your life. And no matter what you're going through, you can change your life. You start learning, you can do that. So. I don't know. <laughs> oh, looks like the guy in the back has some questions. <laughs> What's it like uh, getting a record label? Honestly, we don't. Uh, so we've taken a different approach. A lot of uh, a lot of record labels, independent labels, are genre specific. Um, like uh, some of the friends, some of our friends, some of the bands that we or uh, labels that we brought up, like Wax Tracks, were pretty much an electronic industrial label. Um, Cleopatra does mainly goth rock. You've got uh, um, Metal Blast that does metal. We're kind of going the opposite way because we like music, not just one style of music, not just this little window of music. We like music. If uh, I'm not a big country fan, but if I hear some country, then I'm like, That's, that, that could sell. I like that. We'll put it out. Well, we didn't think we were going to put out hip hop, and now we have like three hip hop artists that are just blow my mind. Incredible from from Canada, as I said, like one of their albums was recorded in a car. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that really answers it, but I, I think you know. I hope so. Like because, as I said, we're really trying to change the industry. We don't uh, like. There's so much change that's happened, and there's so much that we've grown as, as an industry, as a people, as an as artists, that we can do so much without the AI. You add AI in, you add in technology, or you add in any of the other tools, and that, that's the biggest thing: is remembering that all of these things are tools. They're not, they're not crutches. They're not there to to replace the artist. They're there to use with the artist and to help accentuate the artist. I mean, look at how many people can go now and pay $80 and get an album mastered at mastering.com that before wouldn't be a thing. Like, but that's all AI right there. Um, you know, but it's a tool that makes it so Joe Schmo can record an album and have it radio ready without knowing every last little bit. Is it as good as having, say, Flood remix it? Or no, it's, not, it's nowhere going to be close because, you know, AI only has so big of a of a snapshot, really, of what mixing and mastering should sound like. Uh, you know, you can put in, into a computer two de minus two decibels at uh, uh, 12 luffs, et cetera, and a computer understands that, but it doesn't understand those little nuances of... That that string has that vibrato going on right when your voice, right when the singer's voice hits uh, hits, and then you've got that drum. The the computer doesn't see that, but it makes it so you can still put it on the radio. It's not clipping. It's not at, at X Y Z. So I mean, that's one of those amazing things that's uh, that's going on right now with music. Awesome. Thanks so much, John. Thank you. Thank you guys for having us. This was an amazing first experience for me. <laughs> first time for everything.